In 2001, A Space Odyssey, David Bowman communicates with his ship through an advanced AI, HAL 9000, which takes his complex voice commands and, sometimes slightly disobediently, interprets them into the desired reaction to steer the ship, open airlocks, and develop, ultimately, a personality disorder. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. HAL allows control of something hugely complicated by simple means. Today, I want to explore how a startup in the UK River Lane is attempting something analogous to simplify interfacing with quantum computers with 99% less evil sentient AI. Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles. Here we dig into science and innovation and how it can change and shape the world around us. When it comes to quantum computers, most reporting is focused on whether we are there or we aren't there yet. I want to narrow in on some of the steps along the way to making a commercially available quantum computer. Today, I want to talk about operating systems for quantum computers. But first, let me explain why they are of interest to talk about in the first place. This is going to be a bit of a deep dive into how QCs work, so buckle your seatbelts. Over the past several decades, classical computers which surround us today have become increasingly powerful. A great deal of time, money, and energy has been poured into making microchips smaller and faster. But manufacturers are now reaching the physical limit of how small and how fast these chips can be made. Quantum computers are still absolutely at the early stage of development, but what sets them apart and why people are excited by them is because of how their computing power ultimately scales. Classical computers scale linearly with respect to the number of bits that the system contains. But for a quantum computer, their computing power scales exponentially with respect to the number of quantum bits or qubits that are added. This is due to the amount of information that can be stored in a given number of qubits being larger than what can ultimately be stored in the same number of classical bits. N classical bits are able to store two N pieces of information. They can either be on or they can be off, so they can encode for two states of being. Whereas n quantum bits, n qubits, are able to store two to the n pieces of information. Each qubit can be on, off, or anywhere in between. That exponential scaling of quantum computer power gives them the potential to solve highly computationally intensive and previously unsolvable problems. Before we go any deeper, let's touch back very quickly on HAL 9000. The whole point of HAL is to run the complexity that is running a ship on behalf of the crew so that they, the crew, only need to deal with higher order decision making. In order for quantum computers to become widespread, we have a similar problem to overcome. It must be easy for people in different industries to ultimately use them at the end of the day. This is where a quantum operating system would ultimately come in useful, since it would offer a way to control quantum computers in much the same way as Windows, Mac, or Linux controls many different classical computers. Confusingly, the term for this idea is HAL, Hardware Abstraction Layer. I'm not making this up. It essentially means that you, the user, don't need to know what's happening under the hood of your quantum computer to be able to use it. The hardware has been abstracted to a more human, understandable level. River Lane is a UK-based company that has recently made a significant step towards creating exactly that, to simplify the complexity for researchers dealing with quantum computers, as there isn't just one type of quantum computer out there in the world. That complexity comes from the way that we go out and we try and build qubits. Classical computers, by comparison, are relatively simple, relatively straightforward. They represent bits with the presence or the absence of an electrical signal. Effectively, a classical bit is a light switch. It's either on or it's off. No matter what hardware you're using, be it a laptop, a smartphone, or a tablet, a classical computer all uses the same electrical representation of what it means to be a bit. Unlike classical computers, however, qubits for quantum computers come in several different form factors rather than just one, with each involving particles that are governed by quantum mechanics. There are three broad different categories of qubits. The first type of qubit is created using particles of light, called photons, with the state of the qubit being encoded not on whether that particle exists or doesn't exist, but rather on the phase or the polarization state of that photon. 
These are known as photonic qubits. The second type of qubits are made using pairs of electrons in superconductors that are cooled to almost absolute zero. These special pairs of electrons are called Cooper pairs, and they are also able to represent a qubit. And finally, ions trapped in electromagnetic fields offer another platform for qubits where the qubit state is stored in the stable electronic state of each ion. Don't worry about too much of the details there. The important thing is that each of these different implementations of qubits forms the basis of a different implementation of a quantum computer. And beyond that, across the globe, many different companies from startups to large multinationals like Google and IBM are developing their own specific quantum computing hardware with programs being specifically designed to run on that certain architecture. This approach is all well and good for companies with the resources, but it removes the possibility for collaboration between different companies and ultimately it increases the costs for developers that may want to harness the power of a quantum computer. This is where Riverlane's recent launch of their open source software comes into play. The software is designed to enable programs to be developed for quantum computers that don't mind what sort of architecture the program ultimately runs on. The hardware abstraction layer, HAL, Riverlane is developing is intended for it to be an open standard, meaning that other parties ultimately can develop it. Essentially, regardless of the program that you write, you want to be able to run it with the same efficacy and the same speed utterly independent or as independent as possible of the platform that you're running it on. So the question becomes, what does the hardware abstraction layer actually do? How does it work? The HAL provides a standard set of commands which can be implemented on pretty much any device. This is kind of analogous to a scripting language that you can think of like Python. Python is an interpreted language, meaning the instructions that are described in a given program are translated ultimately by the interpreter into machine language that can be run on any given computer. Programs on a quantum computer, by comparison, typically consist of an algorithm. And depending on what kind of algorithm is being used, the HAL offers different levels of speed up. Each level relates to different positions in the hardware stack that can be accessed to run particular commands. This stack is a combination of systems or devices that translates information from the qubit layer, the very lowest level of information, back to electrical signals that can be interpreted by a normal computer. It might say to the hardware layer something along the lines of apply this electric field to these trapped ions or emit these photons from here for this photonic chip or oscillate these Cooper pairs like this, all of which might mean the same thing to the algorithm. The algorithm ultimately doesn't care how it's done, it just knows that those operations need to be completed. The part of the quantum computing system that the HAL directly interfaces with is the QPU, or Quantum Processing Unit. It's the device that performs logical operations on qubits in order to process the data. For example, in a quantum computer that uses photonic qubits, the QPU would be a microchip that contains photonic circuits and components that manipulate the length or the properties of those pathways. The states of these qubits are then measured and interpreted into useful information to be used by the system. The important thing about Riverlane's HAL was that it was developed with many different partners. The partners included famous groups that you may have heard of, like the National Physics Laboratory in the UK, as well as several different startup companies that are developing different architectures of QC. There are a couple of startup companies like Universal Quantum and Oxford Ionics that are developing quantum computers using trapped ion qubits. There's CQC and Oxford Quantum Circuits that are using superconducting bits. And there's Duality Quantum Photonics, which are using photonic bits. By pulling all of these partners together and getting them to build their architectures in a way that this HAL can equally support all of them, the entire quantum community can benefit from using their algorithms on any of these pieces of hardware, ultimately, hopefully, strengthening all of those different hardware players as they come to market. This universality that they're aiming for across different hardware platforms is a really exciting prospect for quantum researchers and for all manner of scientific fields beyond that, as it will allow other people to start to interact with quantum computing much quicker than they would otherwise be able to gain access to it. From my point of view, I think it remains reasonably unclear as to which quantum computing architecture will ultimately be most successful, will come out on top for mass adoption. But this HAL developed by Riverlane ultimately acts as a great intermediary step, which means that all of the quantum scientists, the algorithm developers, the software writers can make great progress moving their understanding forward without needing to tie their development work to any architecture in particular. This should mean 
that quantum computers arrive much faster than they otherwise should. If you like this video, if you have any questions about quantum computers, the different architecture approaches that are out there, I would love to continue exploring that in another video. Leave me a comment down below, ask me a question. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye.